goes even a little bit further back, all right? And the further back one goes back to Constantine. You've heard of the Roman Emperor Constantine. The city Constantinople is named after the Emperor Constantine, okay? A uh, pretty famous emperor. Do you know what he was most famous for? was making the Christian religion the national religion of what was left of the Holy Roman Empire. Which, if you read certain history books, you'll find was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. But uh, Constantine made Christianity the religion of the empire. But he also did something else. See, Constantine said that while it was good that everybody should be a Christian, that it was better for church leaders to have higher education. And so Constantine started working towards this new system where every church leader went through a, a, higher, a system of higher education. We, we now call that seminary. Okay? Uh, but that is not a Bible thing. That is not a New Testament thing. That is a church history thing. That doesn't make it wrong. It just means that it's not what this verse means. You understand the difference? Okay? I'm trying to break some misconceptions that we have about the meaning of this word and what God's getting at here. Okay? So, what does it mean then to be an overseer? Well, look with me, if you will, at Acts 20, 28. It says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Once again, here's the word overseers. The Holy Spirit is the one who appointed these overseers. So it wasn't the fact that they went to seminary. It wasn't the fact that they were great public speakers. It wasn't the fact that they were good business managers or that they had a lot of money to donate to the church. You see, the Holy Spirit called them to be overseers of the church. And then the responsibility that was given was to shepherd the church of God. Which, I love this reminder, which he purchased with his own blood. It is not the overseer's church. It's not the pastor's church. It's not the elder's church. It is Christ's church that he's the one who purchased it. So, we see here in Acts that the call is from the Holy Spirit to shepherd the church of God. 1 Peter 5, 1-6 says, Therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah, and also as a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely, according to God's will, not for the money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you younger men be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on him, because he cares for you. By the way, one of the reasons that I love hearing babies cry is it's just a microcosm of the human nature. I'm not getting what I want, therefore I'm not happy, and you're all going to hear about why I'm not happy. It's, it's fantastic. Reminds me constantly of how frail I am. <laughs> so it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. But here we have, in this context, the shepherding of God's flock, 
to do it eagerly, to do it freely, not out of compulsion, not for money, not lording it over, but being examples, right? And then here God says specifically to be humble because God resists the proud. So the, the overseer, the elder, is one who is to do it because God has led him to do it. He is to do it with humility before God, otherwise God will resist him. What does humility before God look like? Well, let me tell you what false humility before God looks like. Because you've all heard this, and I've heard it as well. False humility looks like this. A preacher stands up and says, I won't say anything unless God says it. So whatever comes out of my mouth, it's because God says it. Why is that false humility? Because the only thing that God says that they are going to say is right here. So unless they only ever read the Bible and never expound on it, then they are being arrogant and they're lying to you. No preacher can ever say that the only thing that I will tell you is what God says. Only someone whose exact words match the exact words of Scripture are, is, can say that I only say God's words to you. But false humility looks like somebody trying to convince you to believe what they're telling you because they want you to believe it's the exact words of God. It's not humility. Therefore, God is resisting them. If God is resisting them, then don't listen to them. But we're surrounded by false humility. To be fair, if I'm going to be honest and open, God's not using me because of how humble I am. He says he gives me grace when I'm humble. And God doesn't use you because of how humble you are. He gives you grace when you are humble before him. You see, humility before God looks like this. God, you are right. Period. What does that mean about me? Most of the time, I'm not right. I can't tell you how many times a week that I look at my kids and I say, I was wrong. That I say to Rachel, I'm sorry, I was wrong. It happens so many times a week, it's, it's redundant around the house. And the kids by now are used to saying, okay, Dad, we forgive you. Why? Because I am not God. I cannot be close to God. He is God. I am not. I am his slave, which makes me the one who's usually wrong. <laughs> but humility is required. Then Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 reads like this, And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. That's a mouthful to read through. Verse 14, then we will no longer be little children tossed about by waves and blown about around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together with every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for the building up, for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So the reason that I read this passage is it describes what God's purpose is for the body 
which is to work together for the growing and maturing of each individual part, which means that the, excuse me, the under-shepherd's job, the, the elder's job, the under-shepherd, the one who is under the Messiah, his job is to encourage the body towards maturity in Christ. You see, he says here, for the training of the saints, verse 12, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. So we have unity in faith, unity in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. You see, maturity in the body has nothing to do with how long you've been saved or how long you've read your Bible. Maturity in the body has to do with how well you understand Christ's fullness. If you're sitting there and you say, to, you say Steve, I'm not sure what that means, that's okay. But how can you honestly think that you have spiritual maturity if you don't even know what Christ's fullness means? I'm not trying to be picky or, or speak down to anybody here. But how often do we find ourselves as spiritual people who love God and we've been to church for many years, think we think to ourselves that we must be spiritually mature. If there is somebody who's spiritually mature, we're probably pretty close. Simply because we've been saved for a long time, we've been to church a lot, we've heard lots of Bible studies, and if, if asked, we could, we could probably talk about some of the major doctrines of the scripture. At least as good fundamentalists, we would hope so, right? But what does it mean to have Christ's fullness? Well, that's something somebody who has spiritual maturity would understand what it means. Because that's what spiritual maturity leads us to. That when we have unity in faith, when we have unity in the knowledge of God's Son, we're going to grow into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So, once again, maturity is not that you went to seminary. Maturity is not how much you know about the Bible. Maturity is not how much of Scripture you have memorized. Maturity is whether or not you understand Christ's fullness. What is Christ's fullness? I'm so glad you asked. Christ's fullness is not complicated. You see, Christ's fullness looks like this. There was a man who came to Christ. He was, a, he was a, um, a lawyer. And he came to Christ and asked him a hard question. He said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, if you know lawyers, you know that a good lawyer knows how to ask the right question. Because it's not the answer that matters. It's the right question that matters. You see, you can ask someone and get the right answer, but if you don't ask the right question, people are going to think what they want to think. You have to ask the right question to get them to think what you want them to think, right? So the lawyer's job is to twist the truth around the right question so that people think what the lawyer wants them to think. So here you have a man who was skilled in the law. He was one of the best of the best of the lawyers that was in the, in the Jewish leadership. And he came to Christ with a question that was so good, none of his fellow men were prepared to answer it. And he said, teacher, which is the one great commandment in the law? Now get this. He expected Christ to think through all 600 and some commandments of the Old Testament, process through that, and pull out one or two maybe of the Ten Commandments that he could then say, well, why did you highlight those over the others? What makes those so important? And yet Christ simply quoted Deuteronomy. The law that these men knew and the law that they claimed to know, Christ went to it and he quoted it and he said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul. And then he switched one word. 
You see, in the in the in the uh, Old Testament, it's the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and might, all your strength. In the New Testament, Christ said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You see, as God, He can do that. Because in the New Testament, Christ was after the heart. He wanted everybody to know what mattered to God was their heart. Were you believing in God's truth? In the Old Testament, when God gave them the law and he gave them this command, he wanted them to work hard at doing the best they could to honor him with the law. There's a new covenant came through Christ. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But he didn't end there. You see, he could have ended there, and the answer would have been done. But he went on to say, and the second commandment is like it, you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. So what is the full maturity of Christ? To know Christ in his fullness is to know what he did to love those around him. He redefined the entirety of God's law because he can. He is God. He explained it for what it really was in a very simple statement. But how many Christians can go through the New Testament and explain how Christ was loving those that he was around because he had to be loving those that he was around or he would have broken God's law. Every single thing that he did was to love those that he was around. So how was he loving them? If we know how he was loving them, then we understand Christ in his fullness. You see, this is what an elder, an overseer, a church leader is supposed to be doing, is to be pointing God's people to why Christ's love is so impacting that it should change the way that we think about how we live and about how we talk and about how we prioritize and not just our lives, but the things that for those around us. You see, because it's not just you and God, because there was a second commandment that said you're to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And so the person who has spiritual maturity, the person who is to shepherd God's people, is to be pointing them back to that which is most important. Understand Christ in his fullness, to lead them towards maturity. So, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, an elder, a bishop, a church leader, he desires a noble work. Why is it a noble work? Because you're pointing people to that which is most important. You're pointing people to that which Christ came to the world to do. You're pointing people to that which brings them to spiritual maturity and understanding of who they are in Christ, in his fullness can't think of a more noble work to do. But here's the, here's the question that I want you to consider at the end of this. Do you have to be ordained as a pastor to do that? The answer that I have come up with is no. You don't have to be ordained as a pastor to do that. What do you have to have? According to Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Holy Spirit has to appoint you to do it. Well, how do you know if the Holy Spirit has appointed someone to do it? Let me explain how easy this is. They're already doing it. Did you catch that? This is how complicated it is. If you want to know if, someone's, if the Holy Spirit's appointed someone to be an elder in the church... They're already doing it. Did you catch that? If the Holy Spirit hasn't appointed somebody to be an, an elder or an overseer in the church, then they're not already doing it. So what is the church's job then regarding overseers? I'm so glad you asked. 
The church's job is simply to recognize those that are already doing the work that the Holy Spirit has called and gifted them to do, and that work is to encourage the body towards understanding the fullness of Christ. And those who are already doing that are by the Scripture's definition serving as an elder. So when Timothy was gone to appoint elders, he was looking for people who were filled with the Spirit doing the work of, sh- of shepherding the body. How did he know what that looked like? Well, clearly God had called Timothy to do it. Clearly God had called Paul to do it. And Timothy and Paul had traveled with others that God had called to do it. So Timothy knew what it looked like. You say, well, how am I supposed to know what it looks like? It's actually not as hard as you might think. It's not that difficult. You see, in the church, there are people that you know regularly work at pointing you to Christ. You know these people by name. You don't necessarily think of them as a pastor. You don't necessarily think of them as an elder. You don't necessarily think of them as a church leader. But you know them because they're always there encouraging you towards knowing and understanding Christ and his purpose. You feel loved by them. You feel like they care. You feel like they understand. It's because they're pointing you to Christ successfully. You see, in aspiring to this position, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's going to gift you for it. It just means that the work that's being done is noble and valuable, and therefore it's a good thing to desire to do it. But when, the, when, when God has called you and equipped you and prepared you, the Holy Spirit fills you to do it and the church sees you doing this work and everybody within the church should be able to look and to say without doubt, obviously that man is doing the work of an overseer. Why? Because he's doing it all the time. Because it's who he is. Because God's called him to do it. You know, I thank God, and I I mean this, I thank God sincerely all the time, every week, I thank God that I am not the only person doing the work of overseer here at First Baptist. And I won't embarrass anybody, but if I wanted to, I could name easily right now four or five men who are actively involved in the work of overseeing the body. Because they're regularly, consistently pointing people around them towards maturity in Christ. Understanding what his priorities are. Understanding what it means to have the fullness of Christ. And to be honest with you, a church that doesn't have that is an unhealthy place to get nourishment. So is this, is this sermon about trying to get more people called pastors around here? No. Is this sermon about getting you to try and do something different re- regarding these men that God has called and equipped? No. It's just simply highlighting what the Scripture says should be happening in Christ's church and then simply recognizing those who are doing it. That's all. And recognizing that if you're not doing it, it doesn't make you a lesser Christian. It doesn't make you a weaker Christian. It doesn't make you a poorer Christian. It just means that, thank God, he's giving you people that are who the Holy Spirit has called and gifted and prepared to be pointing you successfully towards Christ and what knowing his fullness means. And if someone desires that office and isn't ready yet, Just listen to James chapter 1, right? 
We let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Just be patient. Let God's Spirit work through you, prepare you, make you ready to do that work that is a noble work, that is a good thing to desire to do. So we're going to take the next several weeks at least, maybe a couple months, I think. Uh, I think it's a couple months. We're take the next couple months, we're going to go through 1 Timothy 3. We're going to look through the office of overseer. We're going to look through the office of deacon. We're, we're, we're going to highlight, as, it, as God does in the end of the chapter, how that all points us back to Christ, that that's the purpose, is to point us back to Christ. And uh, I trust that this will be an enjoyable study for you. It was really enjoyable for me to be studying and preparing this. And, and here's why. Thank God the leadership of the church doesn't depend on me. And if you know me well, you'll also be thanking God the leadership of the church doesn't depend on me. <laughs> I, I want to close with this story. I know I'm running over, but I want you to hear this. I want you to hear it from me. I want you to hear it in this context today. When God called me to be a pastor, initially, I arrogantly thought, cool. Then I went to seminary, and God in his kindness toward me allowed me, when I was in seminary, to suddenly realize I wasn't cut out for this. <laughs> so I said, God, thank you for the training, but clearly I misunderstood the call. Must be for somebody else. And it was simply because I went through a, se a seminary course and the whole course was on 1 Timothy 3. And we spent a whole semester going through 1 Timothy 3. And at the end of that semester, I went, I went through the che check box list and I went, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> and so then I, I spent the next three years telling God that, he, that I clearly misunderstood him. And the answer that was obvious was nope. And in those three years, God was preparing me and equipping me so that the church would recognize that, yes, God has called Steve to serve as an elder. And then after three years, I finally, in my own frustration, said, okay, God, I still think that that's not a good idea, but I'll say yes if you want me to. I went and I told my wife this revelation that I'd finally said, okay, God, if you want me to, I'll say yes. And she said, Oh, good, I've been praying for the last three years that you'd say yes to that. The point of the story, in my mind, is simple. You shouldn't feel like you bring a lot to the table if God calls you to serve as an elder. The reality, God just calls the lowliest, the dumbest, the weakest, the most useless people, that he says, hey, when everybody looks at you, they're going to say, wow, God must be amazing. Look who he's using. I, I, I wish I could say I was joking, but the scripture specifically says that God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are wise. He uses the weak things of this world to confound the mighty, and that is by the only way, by God's grace, that I can say, okay, God, you've promised in your word that you're going to use foolish and weak old me so that everybody who looks on goes, that must be God. And it should be no different for anyone else that the Holy Spirit has called and equipped to serve as an overseer in the church. So do not think that just because someone has a great gift or someone has a unique ability or someone can do something that you, that you can't, that that means, oh, God must use them as an elder. No, 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 that's not it at all. It has to do with the humility that is needed to get God's grace to effectively serve his people. Sometimes elders have great gifts. But just because someone has a great gift doesn't mean that God's going to use them as an elder. Just like, for instance, someone can be ordained as a pastor, but that does not make them a shepherd. But if someone's serving as a shepherd, then it doesn't matter whether they've been ordained as a pastor. Did you catch that?
Well, I hope this has been an encouragement to you this morning. It was encouraging for me to study and prepare. And once again, I just want to say that I really do thank the Lord that uh, in his love for our church here, that he has equipped and prepared men who are already doing this. And it's beautiful and wonderful. And I'm so blessed. And I hope that if you have been around some of these men, that you will know how blessed you are as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your truth. Lord, we thank you for the joy that it is to serve you. Lord, we thank you that you have called under-shepherds to serve in your church. And Lord, we just ask that you would give us, continue to give us the humility that we need, that we might have your grace to point those around us to what matters most, and that is to understanding the fullness that we have in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.